Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, and my guest this week is Terry Dobson and Igor there, if you're watching the YouTube video, uh, is Parrot. He is a professor of design studies at Azusa Pacific University and a former Disney Imagineer. I can't wait to talk to him more about how he plays for a living, him and uh, Igor having some fun. And if you want to have more fun, flow, and fulfillment in your life, go to playfulhumans.com. You can rediscover some ways to play as an adult, connect with other playful humans, and take a playfulness quiz. Uh, All good stuff at playfulhumans.com. Those of you, again, not watching on YouTube, Igor the parrot uh, was definitely doing some dance moves and uh, got a little dizzy there on the spins at the end on the woos. Uh, Terry, welcome to the podcast. We like to start with the joke of the week. The joke of the week is brought to you by the gym. I have quite a streak going, but I forgot to go to the gym today. That's seven years in a row now. Uh, <laughs> that stuff. All right. All here's right. the official joke. Why did the man get fired from the orange juice factory? Wow. Uh, no, you're going to have to tell me. What you got? He couldn't concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That'll get us done. All right. Uh, so let's start with Igor so that you can set him down and, and he can enjoy the rest of the podcast. Yeah. Um, you bring Igor to your classes as a professor, and I feel like that's a very playful and interesting thing to do. How does Igor add to your your life and your teaching? Oh, my goodness. He has the best comedic timing. I'm normally there, you know, talking to the students and telling them something up on the screen. And I say, isn't that right? He'll go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, I didn't ask for permission. I just bought him. And you know what? I'm so grateful that everybody had just embraced him because I know when I was working at Disney, they wouldn't let anybody bring any pets of any kind. So it's a lovely environment for him to be able to just bring joy. And that's really what it is. It's just about joy, bringing joy to so many people. And I never knew just um, what, a, what a great friend, what a pal, and just what a joy bringer he is. Oh, that's so awesome. And I, I saw him saying happy birthday. Uh, that's amazing. Um, and he can uh, speak and sing very well, but uh, it's really tough to do on camera, right? Any of the uh, the the bird tricks, uh, you said really like the more you want them to do it, the less likely they are. Well, he's just a baby right now. He's a, he's a toddler. So, uh, oh, but really? I hear, yeah, I hear that uh, having a parrot is like having a toddler for life. <laughs> so I mean he's this is how he's gonna be he's so naughty and uh, mischievous he plays tricks on me he sees my kids playing tricks on me he copies not just voice he copies that same um approach just to life he's just he he's fun field too he wants to be playing all the time that's amazing and you did mention for life so I think we should also remind anybody that's thinking about a parrot for a pet that this is a lifelong commitment they and this was like that's 50 right. 60 years, he, right? No, he's, yeah, they on, on Wikipedia, it says 80. But you know what? It oh, was wow. the, it was the first time in my life, other than marriage, where when I put down money, I'm like, wait a minute, I better be sure because there's no going back. This is forever. Yeah. Yeah, that's so great. All right. Well, you can like get him comfortable or, or whatever you want to do for the rest of the podcast. Uh, I appreciate that. He's good. And... Uh, let me ask you a question here about your career. So have you obviously went into to design and you had some sort of creative streak? When was that sparked for you? Do you remember when you were thinking like, oh, I want to be uh, in, in design or has that always been a career for you? You know what? It's so funny because in school, I was accused of having an overactive imagination. And then when I got to Disney, said, no, 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 actually, we like that. That's called the willing suspension of disbelief. <laughs> and that's the, <laughs> that's the that's the magic sauce, the secret sauce at Disney is being able to bring the guests to this point where they willingly suspend their disbelief, willingly just believe in, you know, the ghosts in the Haunted Mansion, for instance. And so that that um, overactive imagination. So we can definitely encourage that in our kids. 
Uh, I think so for sure. And it is interesting. Oftentimes I feel like the thing you're told not to do as a kid is the thing that you're asked to do more of as an adult. And so you really, as you grow up, have to figure that out and, and how to sort that out in your brain. Right. Yeah. The, um, um, just so, so, um, I, I studied, I mean, I did my education backwards. I went through art school and just had a lot of fun and then art school and graduate school. And then Disney hired me out of graduate school, brought me to California. And then I'm like, Whoa, there's no going back. But I have photos of me as a kid dressed up as a cowboy with a green little, uh, bird <laughs> on my shoulder. And so there it was at five years old, the future was already cast, you know, here I am in the California in the West and got the green bird. Yeah, I think uh, it's amazing that, that you nailed it. I'm wondering, um, what was the most fun you've ever had in your career? Because I know that sometimes, like, when it becomes a job, it can not be fun. And then there's sometimes where you're like, this is the dream. And, and you pointed out to me, you have a, a patent from Disney on uh, the wall, too. Tell us about that and, and maybe any other, like, highlights of your career. You know what, my um, just you know, first of all, just working at Disney, amazing. Just uh, you know, doors opening that you never would imagine. But the first day I started, they said this guy, he's going to be your buddy. And he walked in the door, way down the other end of the building. He saw me, he immediately turned around and walked back out again. And that was the start of a fantastic twenty-five year best friend relationship. And that was the most fun going to work meeting your best friend and saying hey let's go for coffee and brainstorm and then you come back hey a little bit more brainstorm let's go for lunch and so it was an amazing opportunity but more than anything the people right just and collaborating with so many amazing different uh, disciplines uh, magicians and scientists computer science i mean just you name it right there's so many what kind of work did you do there what was your your job title and what was your day-to-day -day? yeah so i trained as a graphic designer but my title was never graphic designer it was first show designer in disney imagineering creating shows and a concept designer art director and then creative director so that trajectory was was never kind of you know uh, laid out ahead of time it was simply just about um being right place right time and just moving with the opportunities that came but I designed attractions. I was on the creative side. And so oh, wow. essentially with a Disney, um, you know, any kind of attraction, the budget breaks down into the three big buckets. There's the facility, the big building, there's the ride system, and then there's creative. And so we get a third of the budget to be able to, to bring the show to life. So that was my job on the creative side. But again, it's, it's, um, it's such an amazing opportunity to be able to extend one's creativity into outside of the discipline I studied, which was art and design. And so animation, music, sound, voiceover, um, you know, in the construction of the actual facility itself, getting into the engineering, special effects, the lighting, even just understanding, you know, just you know, when you walk into a physical space and the, the producer would say, well, what color do you want the ceiling? And so I started thinking about it, but then it's like, no, don't spend any money on that. Just paint it black. Nobody looks up. There. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We got money to spend on other things. So uh, what was the patent for? And did you work yeah. on any attractions we would recognize? or any, Yeah, any so it was funny. And here's, a, again, a little bit of a kind of cautionary tale. So um, the one attraction that lasted the longest was at Disneyland here, 1997, for the new uh, Tomorrowland. And it was the intervention. So it was the old Carousel of build, uh, Progress building that Disney created for the 64 New York World's Fair. It was brought back to California. It ran for a while and then set in disrepair. In 1997, we came in, we made it turn again. And we put in this, this attraction called Interventions. I was a creative director, but in the middle, there was this structural support column that held up the whole pavilion. And when I first walked in, I'm like, hey, that's got to go. And they're like, no, 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 you can't get rid of that. So we spent a million dollars <laughs> theming the treehouse of technology. And that's all, it did nothing. It was just to hide this column in the center. But on the tree at that time, the fabricators, they carved my name in a stump with my first wife's name. And that was the mistake <laughs> for anybody getting <laughs> for a tattoo. It's just be careful because that that tree stump yeah. lasted 15 years. And my students here, when I started working at APU, would go down to Disneyland and visit it. And they're like, Terry, you you. you yeah, I didn't know you you had a different name for uh, your your wife. I'm like, oh yeah, I don't want to talk about that. So <laughs> <laughs> the attraction lasted longer than the marriage. Uh, yes, that, yeah, that yeah, sometimes, yeah. Uh, but that happens. Uh, so then, tell us about uh, APU and and why you moved from Disney to teaching and what you find 
uh, fun and interesting about teaching? Oh my goodness. You know what? It's, it's, um, I met my wife after 20 years of working. It's amazing. Uh, just amazing place. Right. But it's still a job and it's still a business. And so when I met my wife, she's a professor. I'm like, wait a minute, you get to have the summer off. You get sabbaticals. There are not many things good about being a professor, but, um, definitely sabbatical in the summer. So you know, I want to be a professor. She's like, no way. And we had the biggest argument of our relationship that day. But here I am <laughs> eleven years later. And so that was kind of the opportunity to step into this role and bring all of that good stuff from Disney, but do it in a more ethical way and bring it to the students and show them, you know what, you can use this for good. Design can be used for good. It doesn't just have to be used for selling. I did a lot of selling. I think there's a lot of landfill out there that I created from Disney that I'm Thank not you. proud of, right? So how can we just bring all of this in? And the pattern you mentioned was something um, interesting. The, the marketing guides at Disney came to me one day and said, hey, Terry, we got this idea. It's called Tweenfluence. I'm like, ooh, tell me more. And so they said, well, here's the deal, right? We're going to advertise to tweens to then uh, get them to talk to their parents to take them to Disneyland. I'm like, wow, that's really nefarious. All right, I'm in. How do we do this? So that was <laughs> the pattern on the wall. It was a buy one at Disney, get one free for your avatar online. So we created Virtual Magic Kingdom. It was the first massively multiplayer online video game at Whoa. Disneyland. And so that was kind of one of the ideas that was out there at the time was how can you create connectivity with the people at the park and online simultaneous play. Uh, it was a big fail, but they got a lot of people <laughs> to Disneyland and uh, and that part of it worked. And there's the pattern. But. Uh, that's so awesome. I wanna ask you more about community and influence for sure, but I wanna circle back to what you said because I think for your design students, but also for anybody watching that thinks like they might want to make their passion or their hobby like a career or or sell things. I think there are some things that you need to think about it and decide. I was a graphic designer and web designer in my my 20s and mostly started on the website side, but then I got into promotional products and signage and other things. And I'll never forget this one client that just wanted a really big banner that was yellow with black text that you could see from space that said, you know, like rooms available on the side of their hotel. And I did everything I could do to sell something else. So I, I was like, gave them sample designs. I was like, look, we can use full color. We can use people. I could use, you know, use different fonts. They're like, no, we want Arial on black <laughs> on a bright yellow, you know, like lime green uh, banner. And we want it huge. Uh, and I was just like, okay, it's your sign. I, I guess that's what I'm, I'm going to make. But I don't think a lot of people when they dream about, especially kids oh. and college students, but even artists, uh, you know, painters or, or other types of creatives or graphic designers think, oh, I, when I want to do this for my career, I want to make ugly stuff for people because they <laughs> pay me money. It's How a, do you balance that? And, and what story, do you tell your students? Storytelling. Design is storytelling. And as soon as I figured that out, it was really coming to Disney. When I was in grad school, I realized I mean, I'm designing for my peers. And that's such a small segment. When I came to yeah. Disney, it's like, wait a minute, there's grandchildren, there's grandparents, there's like that full spectrum. And the commonality was story. So my, you mentioned earlier, like the, my favorite time, it was working with my best buddy, but also it was that cusp, right? Where Disney characters up until 1994, around that time when um, the Disney mythologies weren't allowed to mix. So Cinderella, yeah. Mickey Mouse, Pirates of the Cat, you couldn't put them in the same product together. So that was the breakthrough in the digital realm. And to have these stories fully formed and characters that were at your disposable to then bring into new stories, that was the most amazing opportunity, right? To pick up these crown jewels and to create new storytelling with them. You know, that that's interesting. And I have a lot of follow-up questions there too. So I'm, I'm going to like start write, writing these down here in a second. But um, I love what you said about the whole audience, because that reminded me of my DJ days. In my 20s, I also DJed in bars and clubs. And uh, you know, some DJs or performers would be like, I'm going to do my thing. I'm just going to, uh, you know, play what I want to play. And if they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. But I found that like when you're doing a wedding, you have to do uh, play songs for six-year-olds and 106-year-olds. And you really are trying to get everybody involved. And I love that part of bringing people together. And I think once you realize that it's not about you, it, it's about the audience 
that's where the magic happens, whether that's in the storytelling and the design that you're doing, or whether that's in the music and the experiences, you got to kind of create an environment that allows everybody to relate to that story. And, and that's a hard thing to do. Well, I also think that that's now where I find the sweet spot teaching a creative. Uh, I, and I, 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 I focus on training career creatives. So it's not about training graphic designers or specific individuals for disciplines. It's about women that you want a career where you're going to go to work every day and you're going to smile and have fun, don't you? And of course, everybody's not in, right? You're a career creative. How that now transpires and works out, that's what we're going to um, hone in on. But that was the kind of the... Um, the kind of the commonality and crossover of making an environment that's conducive to creativity and and that Disney training I think that helped me to kind of forge that in the classroom and I certainly now are having the most fun when my students are enjoying just I just enjoy it they come to class I'm grateful that they come to <laughs> class no no they have options right yeah, that's true right if they want to zoom and stay in their pajamas they can but they really they crave community and that was what we missed in covid i i kind of went from being no i'm going to train the best designers ever to like wait a minute <laughs> i just now i appreciate the co-curricular the extracurricular um, all of those are the what makes up a college experience and maybe even more important because it forms you as a human and it creates your peer group that you're going to travel through life with so let's go there next because I find that fascinating and, and very playful in what I do is my actual job title now for my day job is director of community engagement. Oh, wow. And there is a lot of design and structure and planning that goes into this. A lot of times uh, communities do kind of grow organically, but if you're trying to do it around a product or an organization or with a particular mission, you kind of have to organize a lot of different moving pieces. How do you see design and community coming together? I've always thought of them as separate really until now. Yeah. Um, so I, I, this, just this year, I, I was promoted. Now, the only other job that I, um, I have and the only job in my life I ever got to wear a uniform, I'm Cupmaster. And so our pack went from 50 two years ago under COVID to 167 families um, with Cup Scouts wow. now. And so the, the number one quality that I've been able to cross-pollinate from my teaching back into Cup Scouts is enthusiasm. And so the mm. parents have got to be enthusiastic. Teachers have got to be enthusiastic. And it's been at the kind of the, the again, the secret sauce that has really grown our pack and that community there because of the enthusiasm and the willingness to really kind of just come alongside families, parents, young kids, you know, and just see how we can uh, make a difference in their life. And I think especially in Cub Scouts and young boys, because most of their role models in, in elementary school are female teachers. I mean, there's the sports coach, right? But, you know, if, if the kids are not into sports, they need some other um, role model males. And so this has kind of been another area that I've kind of, and he's our pack mascot. He's helped a lot. I mean, Herding cats, yes, that's what it is like with Cub Scouts of the early uh, years, but he really helped a lot, even across, I mean, so in every aspect of my life, Ego, he's not just a best friend, emotional support, therapy bird, he's he's the one that the, the Cub Scouts are listening to as well. Love that. I'm an Eagle Scout myself. I had a, a great time doing all of that as a kid, but I wanted to circle back a little bit to um, design thinking, because I, for me, it's a lot more playful and the, the message of this podcast than sometimes what people think about um, scientific design and like measuring it and improving and, and data. And I've kind of found in my life that once you start measuring one thing, you have to measure all of the things because they're all related. And so like any single metric is a bad metric, but I have found some magic in design thinking that where you put the speaker for a concert or where you put a screen in a room or the way you arrange the desks in a classroom really makes a big difference on the types of interactions and attitude and community building you can do in that space. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on design thinking. I love that for your whole career or your life or in a community space. Are, are there any ways that you think about your creativity in a, a structured way? Totally. Yeah. It's one word, Mike, empathy, empathy. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to go down to Disneyland once one day a week and just watch people. I used to stand in line as a silver pass holder. I would go to the outside the gate and choose a family and just walk with them and say, hey, look, I'm going to 
I'm going to comp your ticket today and, and let you in, right? But I would learn from them and just come alongside them. So the same thing is true here. Um, again, I mentioned secret source a lot, but our secret source here at, at APU is empathy. I mean, we already have these wonderfully fully formed humans, right? Who are just so genuine and authentic. My job is just move the needle, continue moving the needle in the right direction with, with all of them. But it's uh, it, the empathy is the first stage of design thinking. I'm glad you brought that up. It's really not about coming in and being the sage on the stage and telling you what you need. It's I'm listening and understanding. And I've come a long way. <laughs> Working at Disney, it kind of, it trains you kind of in a way that you feel like you, you know, the the people in charge are the ones who will dictate your future. They will tell you when you're going to get the car, company car, when you're going to become a, an executive, all of that. And life is so much richer. Once I was outside that and I realized, wait a minute, I can manage my own time. Um, but I also, I can do what I, um, what I, what I, what I saw happening at Disney and that they are very diverse, they are very inclusive, they need to be, and we're kind of moving now, we're, we're, we're a long way behind in, in higher yeah. education too, but that's kind of where it is, it's like me understanding as a designer how I can then bring that same empathy to the students, but that's the, that's the secret sauce, it really is. I love those two lessons there, because it's right really where I've landed, that we can measure everything, we can create frameworks, we can kind of do some stuff to manufacture some things, but you said if you bring enthusiasm and empathy, you're going to make a lot of right decisions. You're going to figure it out along the way. And the rest of them are just kind of choices. Somebody else can measure and manage and do the detailed projects. I think when you're trying to come with playfulness and creativity and, and design, it really takes those uh, emotions to be right. And how you are doing the task is more important than what you're doing sometimes. So my last question for you is, have you ever gotten burnout? What do you do? What do you, when you feel like the tank is empty and you're like, I got no more ideas left. I, I you know, I'm burnt. I'm out. I've, I've done it. What, what do you do then to kind of rediscover that energy and enthusiasm? I think I mentioned Mike earlier, I got four boys uh, one of them just graduated college. The other one's high school, bad to go to college and two elementary. And they just, there's so, um, there's so much energy between them. We adopted one of these little boys from South Korea, 2019. And he was about the same age as my son. And they're just so wonderful, their relationship. This guy is super jealous. He wants to be around them all the time. And that's where I, I get my energy. I just, I just adore being around. It's for me, it's like I just built my... My third tree house, the one I mentioned at Disney, and I built two oh, tree houses yeah. since then. Um, mostly it's because, you know, I wanted to be up in the trees with him. He loves being up there. But the kids, I mean, just trying to stay one step ahead of them, designing experiences for them. This tree house is going gonna to teach them in climbing in a safe way because we can... Uh, rope them off and uh, just let them practice but all of that is just I actually I don't believe in creative block I really um I, yeah. you know, I I teach my students look you sketch and when you're burned out when you finish then you just switch into words write down your words email it to yourself you're more just as likely to come up with an idea that way so switching frameworks switching the way we think um and switching from pictures into words I've always found that that's that overcomes any type of creative block but from an energy and just excitement, enthusiasm and ideas, my kids, just an endless resource. And I love being around them. Wow, I love that. I just want to highlight it in plus one of that switching because I have, haven't have articulated it that way before either. But if your energy is feeling drained from people, then go and like focus and do a, a puzzle or a, a creative writing task. Or if you're not drawing, then write. If you're not writing, then draw. And then... Uh, get outside, change your environment. I, I think a lot of people think that the downtime or the stopping helps and that just creates more blocks. It, it puts more stress on yourself. I like active recovery is the word that psychologists use. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about with your kids. If you go do something active, it actually brings you more energy. If you tune out, watch Netflix and, you know, eat too much and lay on the couch, you're not going to have more energy at, at the end of that to get back to your creative pursuits. So uh, great advice there. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. Are you ready to play a game? We are. We're ready. All right. We're spinning our wheel of games and you got two truths and a lie. 
Uh, two truths and a lie is pretty easy. We're going to say two fun facts about ourselves, then one that is completely made up, and you're going to try and guess which one is the lie. So I picked some from uh, college here as a college professor. I won first place in sports writing in college from the uh, Missouri College Media Association. I was voted Mr. Park University in a male beauty pageant <laughs> in college, or I doubled my GPA when I switched from a public university to a <laughs> private university. Wow. Um, I'm going to go with truth for the first one. Um, I'm going to go for you're a pretty handsome, dude. I'm going to go for that one, too. I'm going to go for the third one's the lie. Oh, so close. No, it was the second one. I actually got runner up in the Mr. Park University pageant. <laughs> See, there was some uh, truth in it though, right? <laughs> so it was close. Yeah, I, I had to put, throw some truth in there. And then, uh, yes, I, I'm not extremely proud of it, but uh, my first shot at the public university was a 1-9, uh, and I graduated with a 3-8 uh, GPA. <laughs> so once I got that figured out, I uh, did a lot better. Uh, all right, how about you? Two truths and a lie. Yeah, my dad back in England was a, um, a bird keeper at the zoo in London um, for a good amount of time. Um, when I was at Disney, I had to meet with the Arab League of Nations to pitch them on um, Israel being a, um, um, a, an actual pavilion at Epcot. And then since I, um, um, since I lost, uh, we lost contact with each other, I was in hospital with first and second degree burns. From a barbecue explosion. <laughs> From a barbecue explosion? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, these are all sound pretty good. But I'm going to say maybe you would have had a bird by now if your your father was uh, in avi yeah. uh, aviary. Uh, <laughs> so all is right. that the lie? You got me. Hey, there we go. Oh, yeah. I won. I tell you what, I'll still let you have the prize, though. Uh, a free... 30 seconds. The podcast is yours. Anything that you can say to help us or anything we can do to help you, uh, the time is yours. Uh, you we'll bet. Thanks, share. Mike. I, I just, um, I, I appreciate this, you doing this, all right? This is great to be able to focus in on other ways that people can have fun and bring joy and humor to their life and those around them. That's all I want to do here at Azusa Pacific University. So come join us and have fun. I love that. There is a link to a video, uh, Terry's welcome video for APU and the, the design department in the show notes. Uh, Azusa Pacific University, check them out online. And we learned a lot today. We talked about uh, the power of having a birds and, and parrots in your classroom, in your life, uh, playing with kids and being a Cub Scout leader, uh, building tree houses, all kinds of cool ways to play. And then also uh, play for a living with design, imagineering, and teaching, all kinds of cool stuff. I really appreciate it today. Terry Dobson was our guest. I'm Mike Montague with Playful Humans. If you would like to rediscover the power of play, get some reminders, go to playfulhumans.com, share this podcast with somebody that you think needs to hear it. You can take a playfulness quiz, playfulhumans.com slash quiz. There's 10 different ways to play. You can find out which one you prefer uh, throughout that quiz. It's super fun. And uh, any suggestions for guests, cool, playful people, people you think I should interview, send them to me and we'll get it done. Go play. Don't wait for the Hey, you did it. You made it to the end, but don't worry. There are plenty of more videos where that came from. Just click subscribe to Playful Humans to get notified about our future videos. Now, what are you still doing here? Go play.